shitting my pants. Um, I hate to public speaking, but I'll try my best. Right, is, everybody, is there a good like, um, sort of translation thing going on? Can all the Chinese people understand what I'm saying through translation right now? You can. All right, because I just thought of a really good idea, which is this. All right, uh, systematic translator, make sure you translate this. Right. Hello, this is the translator speaking. I just want to say that the speaker is incredibly good looking and has the coolest company in Beijing. Did that work? Good. Right, um, what I'm talking about today is immaturity, which is considered uh, by so many people as a bad thing. Um, but I wouldn't be standing here today shitting my pants if I wasn't immature. Um, it's probably one of the most important superpowers that I have. And in the 20 minutes I've got, I'm going to try my best to tell you that how immaturity has taken me from a guy who uh, flunked out of school age 17 because of dyslexia and ADD and all these things, and decided to follow his own route in life, his, sort of, uh, uh, you know, his, own, his own story, or build his own story, educate himself. Uh, Mark Twain said, I never let my schooling interfere with my education, and I'm a big believer in that, because the schooling I had was crap. I went to these uh, very posh English schools, boarding schools, and because I was dyslexic and ADD, I didn't fall into that mainstream of education about how you get educated. So I was kind of left behind. So I decided to drop out at an early age and, uh, and travel the world. By the way, this photographer is climbing Mount Everest. He's an amazing guy. And that's another reason I'm shitting my pants and being in front of this guy here. Um, so um, we'll start with my story. Have we got the PPT going? I'm not too good with our images. So um, what I'm going to do is just give you some examples, um, because I do have many, many superpowers. Um, and they're all related to, um, to this disorder that people call ADD. One of them is you know, being impulsive, another one is being distracted, another one is being a daydreamer. But today I'm going to talk about um, immaturity. Is it working? Almost. Almost. Right, I'll make up some more stuff. Um, so, uh, so um, here we go. Class the T-shirts, the name of the business I started in Beijing in 2005-2006. We were the first... Um, creative store on, uh, on Nanabusian, and then Nanabusian actually blew up and, uh, and became a really popular place. So I wrote this, um, which is the kind of stuff I've got online, so it says, what is immaturity? Acting without a sense of consequence, not taking oneself too seriously, uh, fearlessness, and the spirit of the young, revolution, right? I absolutely love that, and without that, where would we be? It's so important to have the spirit of the young with us. You know, but Steve Jobs said, stay hungry, stay foolish. Now the foolish part is really the immaturity, because immaturity is very closely linked to creativity. Young people are incredibly creative, they just don't quite know how to express their ideas yet. And the conundrum is, as you get older, uh, you can express your ideas, but you lose all your immaturity, and you lose all your creativity. So if you can hold on to that immaturity from when you were young, to as you get older, you can express your ideas, so you can be creative when you're older. Does that make sense? Here I am, age 17, I left England, went traveling around the world, ended up in China in 1993, I've been here almost 20 years now, um, and I've always been an entrepreneur, because no one would ever employ an idiot like me. Uh, there I am in India, and there I am in the fifth city in 1993. There's my first job in China, riding a horse to work in Inner Mongolia, and here's my very first idea, right? This is fantastic. One day, I was in a hutong, and I saw a tourist wearing this t-shirt. Mm, have some water, please. Um, and, um, I thought, this is the, the worst t-shirt in the world. Um, um, who, I mean, uh, sorry, I've got one here. Thanks. Excuse me, I'm a bit shaky here. Mm, mm. Sorry, all this energy is coming out. Right, so, um, this t-shirt was for sale from when I arrived in 93 until 2005 when I started class t-shirt. I thought, this is the crappiest t-shirt in the world. Beijing deserves better t-shirts, so I'm going to do it. I can't design, I don't know fashion or anything. But because I really don't know anything, I don't really care, and I'm fairly fearless, and I'm immature, so what did I do? I looked around me for inspiration, I saw this sign. Now in Beijing, green hills and blue sky can sell anything. If you're opening a restaurant, if you're opening a car fix-it shop, anything, plaster a car on it, plaster anything on green hills and blue skies, it'll sell for sure, right? A Xinjiang restaurant, a couple of Xinjiang people put sheep on there and a cow on there because you're going to eat them, and you've got a Xinjiang restaurant sign, and there's one there. So I thought of this design aesthetic, and I thought, I'm going to change that I climbed the Great Wall t-shirt, and what I did was I took a beautiful woman from the internet, I just plastered her on the top. There's my very first t-shirt, right? <laughs> very immature, but I have to tell you, this was my worst-selling t-shirt to date, but from this 
came everything. So the importance of ideas is that you do them. The only difference between me and you, if you're not an entrepreneur, if you're not doing something right now in your life, is that I actually do things. That's it, really. We've all got ideas. You're either brave enough to do them or you're not. And life is very, very short. And remember one thing, we're all going to die, right? So just remember that. You might as well do it. Worst case scenario is always the thing I think about. What's the worst case scenario if I do this t-shirt brand? I lose a bit of money, maybe a bit of face. Who cares? I'm going to do it. So Plastic was born from a nice, immature idea. Here's my very first successful design. It was a subway ticket. A nice saying up there about being courageous because I am quite fearless, I have to say, despite being here right now looking very nervous. Um, I am quite fearless when it comes to ideas. I just do them. This subway ticket, I've sold thousands all around the world. There's even like, some dickhead in France who's copied it and selling it in his own shop. Um, and this um, was my sort of route into the fashion industry because I realized it was the icons that were selling. And how did this design happen? This design happened because Three years previous to this, I took the subway ticket, I stopped off at a printing shop, and I made one that was two meters long. I decided I was going to go on the subway, see if I could get into the subway with a two meter long subway ticket. <laughs> and when I got to the entrance of the subway, the woman saw it, saw the ticket, let me in for free. And I tried it three or four times, and every single time it worked. So again, a very immature idea that works quite effectively. Here's another nice immature idea, where you take something new and something old. Now we all know these, he's a Xiao Bang Gao, illegal advertising. This is a plumber, right? He's got his phone number, he's got his service, he sprays it on a tree, you call him up, and uh, you know, hey presto, that's his advertising. Well, take that modern idea, combine it with something old, and you've got another nice immature design. What did I do? I took Mao Zedong, of course, so many Mao t-shirts, but I wanted to do a special one. So we took Mao, his most expressive, his famous saying, and then we created a t-shirt, way ready for all, with Mike's telephone number on it. <laughs> Again, very, very successful design, this one. People wearing it all over the place. This phone number, I use a lot. Like uh, the, the, the speaker just now, who's awesome, that guy, he gave out his phone number. I give my phone number out to everyone via the medium of my t-shirts. Uh, although I don't answer this one, I have a secretary that does that, because it calls a little bit too much. Right, my first shop was um, on Nalagusi There were no shops on there. I spent uh, 40,000 RMB, and I opened up a little shack that was falling down. Uh, and uh, I used all these kind of very immature ways to, uh, how do you say, strength run, to market my business. Um, this business, I started with 40,000 RMB. By the end of the second year, I was turning over close to a million dollars a year. Can you believe that? With an initial investment of 40,000 RMB. Why? Because I put tons of energy into promoting the brand and getting people to find out about just how immature I and the brand were. Right, now you can see now that we see I'm going to open the store, and you can see what it looks like now. A huge amount of change. Right, and there's our current store, and again, we're in the creative business, so, you know, that eight, the, current, the front of that eight changes every five days. Everything changes all the time in the shops. The only way you can stay ahead in the creative industry. Another bit of humor, immaturity for you. You'll remember the toilets in Beijing, you had these tiles on the outside, you know, you go to the men's, you go to the women's. They destroyed all those toilets before the Olympics. That really pissed me off, so I decided to protect that art on the wall of my shop by celebrating Beijing toilets. Again, a very immature, but very, very successful idea. And my first campaign, my very first marketing campaign was taking rude words on stickers and putting them in taxis and office blocks and restaurants. And it would have a rude word at the bottom and say, this was brought to you by Plaster T-shirt. Um, and then it would have my telephone number on it. And that cost me about 500 RMB. My second marketing technique was to find a local nutter that lived on Nana Gushan, who was completely insane. He walked up and down the street. He's still there today and he laughs at everyone. Everyone loves him. I gave him a free plastic t-shirt and he walked up and down the street. It was a walking advert for me. But I didn't realize he's going to wear it for three months without taking it off. <laughs> um, then I decided that I was going to do uh, a Hutton catwalk show. This was a kind of fearless thing because, long story short, I went to the local residence committee, I said, I want to do this uh, catwalk show. They said that they'd help me out, the lovely old IEs there. The morning of the show, the police turned up and said, you're not allowed to do events in China without permission. We all know that in China, there's so many bodies, right? The police, the district government, the local government, they're all trying to stop you, right? Well, I don't give a fuck, I'm sorry, I don't care. I'm going to do it, right? Why? Because I'm kind of fearless and this is my idea. So what I did was I went through with it. I ended up being taken to a police station or interrogation room with the district government, local government, the police. And I said, I'm sorry, uh, people are coming, I've really invited them, so like it or not, this event's going to happen. And one by one, each department stood up. The district government guy stood up and said, well, you're not allowed to do it, but I don't know you're doing it. The policeman said, you're not allowed to do it, and I don't know you're doing it. And it ended up with me and an old IE from the local residence committee. I said, what does that mean? She goes, in China, that means you can do it. 
because no one's taking responsibility, right? Which is, uh, again, one of those very Chinese things. Okay, how did I promote the show? Well, again, I was very immature in the way that I promoted the show. I didn't just send emails to people. What I did is I targeted the most important media in China, who I thought would report on Beijing's first ever Hutong Catwalk show. And I sent them targeted gifts. I found out who the names of the fashion editors were. I found out what they did with their lives. I created false aliases online, became friends with them. I found out different things that they did. And I sent them targeted gifts. So this is one guy who worked in a fashion magazine who was in pizza restaurants every day. So what did I do? I found his address. I made a pizza box, opened it up. Inside was a picture of me with a speech bubble saying, Hi, I'm Tony Johnson Hill. I'm inviting you to my fashion show. And then the pizza, I took pepperoni. I made an eight. And there was an invitation letter inside for him. Spent about 100 RMB getting that to his door. He turned up at the show. He put that, he, he wrote about the show in the fashion magazine. And so, you know, to get an advert that big in the fashion magazine like his is probably 200,000 RMB. I spent 100 uh, RMB on it. It was very mature and it worked. We even sent sex toys to another guy. Like you enjoy doing that kind of thing, which was very immature. And the catwalk show was a big hit. So about 100 people turned up. And then as the years went on, it became you know, the first one, the police and the government all turned up and enjoyed it, right? They were going to, you know, whatever. Um, and then the next one, the, the government actually paid for. And then we got to the third one, we had, I don't know, about five, six hundred people turn up. I always walk out at the end like a dickhead and, you know, like, you know, Tommy Hilfiger or something. And everybody claps. And we had TVs there as well. You can see just how many people turned up to the third who's on catwalk. So it's very, very, uh, very, very uh, successful. Here's another technique I used, again, quite immature. Um, I take the local eyes from the residence committee, dress them up in plaster t-shirts, they dance outside the shop. Uh, it's always been very effective. There's uh, all the ladies that work in my shops, our local matriarchs. They live in the areas. You know, I have a shop here in 798, we've employed local eyes. We have one in Nanobisyan, and this is actually my landlady, as well as um, a local matriarch. And they're all part of the brand. And we give them a little hot red thing here that doesn't say you where it says Trump is here. Okay, one day, here's one of my most immature stunts of all time. I love this one. Right, um, what I did was, one day she came to my shop, she's very famous, do you know who she is? Yeah. Alright, Louis Oyla, she's like a China Oak kind of lady. Anyway, she said, I want you to come on my show. My initial reaction was, oh my god. But then I kind of found out that, you know, where she lived, I sent her a gift, I made a t-shirt for her. Um, I sent it to her home before the show saying, if you wear my t-shirt on the show, you'll change my life. Send her some chocolates and other things like that. And then on the show itself, I had this t-shirt that I designed that, um, you know those Xiao Gong guys you get in China that say things like Ban Zhang and Shou Yao, you know, and it's got like a telephone number on the bottom. Well, I, I designed one that said Shou Yao, which is like, you know, I will buy your secondhand drugs. And it said, on, and it had my telephone number on the bottom. Now her show, you've got 20 million people that watch it. So I went on to her show, with a t-shirt with my telephone number on it, and she had one that said Gong Bao Ding, which is like spicy chicken with peanuts. Um, and uh, that became our biggest ever selling t-shirt after she wore it on the show. And my telephone number was broadcasted to about 20 million people, and my phone never stopped ringing from that day, and it still rings today. And that's how I got my first ever wholesale customers. An immature stunt that turned into tons of money, trust me. Right, the Go team, I even got them in plastic t-shirts by walking into a restaurant that they were eating before a show and uh, brought out my t-shirts and showed them to them like sort of feather dusters and you know, they just like this t-shirt, this t-shirt, I said you can have any of my t-shirts for free and uh, they ordered a whole bunch and sent them to the hotel with little personal notes the next day they had a performance, this guy wore one of my t-shirts, this picture ended up in a British newspaper and then I made tons of money through a licensing deal with a British t-shirt brand. So it was all about really sort of barging through the door and impressing the band by being silly about all the designs that I had and it turned into some really hard cash. Uh, what we do with our window is quite immature sometimes too. We get people to sit in the window of the shop. Sometimes we have local rock bands. Um, uh, there's a local rock band called Fan Wang Jing or Reflector, people like that. Um, and another time I got two foreigners to dress up as prostitutes in the window because they wanted to promote their brand called Gun Ho Pizza. Um, and that was also very popular until the police turned up. Um, here's some sort of um, fun ideas with design. We take sort of Western ideas and Chinese ideas and put them together. This is Lei Fang, he's a, you know, a, a communist idol. As was Jesus Christ was an idol or is an idol, excuse me, Christians in the audience. And um, basically we took the idea of stained glass windows and we made them into Chinese. Uh, there's there's line, and Lei Fang is a stained glass window. Okay, here's another really fun immature design idea. Uh, the old, um, you know, uh, revolutionary ballet that Mao's wife came up with. I always thought it would be great to have a revolutionary ballet design. So I found a local tattoo artist. I said, I want you to make some beautiful 
revolutionary ballet ladies with guns and hand grenades, make them super sexy, and, uh, and then add in some of your own creativity, and we've got our best ever selling design of all time, which is this one here. <laughs> it's a bit immature, I know, but it's uh, very, very effective. People love it. People love immature people. Jenny, you know what? From today, I hope you start to think that immaturity is a fantastic thing, because people are getting extremely boring these days. The more and more people I meet, the more and more I'm unimpressed. You need to really get back to your roots and find your immature gene. Another thing we do is uh, uh, a very important emotion, or uh, how would you say, a value of mine is, is, is or whatever, is, I'm not very good at English. Uh, empathy uh, is that we always support children's charities and everything we do at Plus is we give a percentage of all our profits to children's charities in China. Right, um, here's a really immature thing, uh, because I'm wrapping up uh, in a minute. Um, I won an award. I've never won an award in my life. I won British Entrepreneur of the Year in China. It doesn't really mean much, does it? Who, who cares? But the most important thing was that this dickhead called Prince Andrew gave me the award. And um, I can't stand the royal family because... Can you read that on the back of my shirt? Shall we do it because I love socialism, right? So uh, we had a guy from the Royal Family come and give me a, a, an award. I didn't like him at all. So in the picture at the end with all the finalists, I decided I was going to you know, do a silly pose. So I did a royal V, which in England means screw you or piss off and all that kind of stuff. So there, we, there I am in the picture with the British ambassador, and uh, what's his name again? Andy. Um, and, uh, and I held that pose the whole time to make sure they got my royal V. And then the next day I make it into a Chinese paper, the China Daily. I always want to be in the China Daily. And, but, but unfortunately, they cut off my arm and replaced my head um, with... Uh, with, uh, with, a, with a different picture of what I look like a war victim. Um, so um, that um, was one of my most immature stunts. But I, uh, I took that, of course, in this paper, and I sent it to tons of blogs, tabloid magazines in England, and made it into a big uh, sort of marketing thing, uh, because I love marketing. My two strengths in the business are creativity and marketing, and I tend to stick with those. Oh. Right. Um, what I will say is I'm going to play a video now. Uh, what we do at Plaster is we create a lot of uh, original content online. And I came up with this idea um, about two years ago. I was in a hotel in China. I was watching these adverts on television that were absolutely ridiculous. It was like, there was a story of this woman who had no breasts, and she was really unhappy. She was obviously an actress. And she walks up to this guy, and he's just like, oh, I've got no breasts. And he's like, oh, no worries, I've got this super pill. If you eat it, you'll have massive breasts within a couple of weeks. And she's like, oh, great. She goes away, and then she comes back, and she's got a new boyfriend. Her life has changed. It was an advert for these pills. Can you believe that? It's absolutely right. I thought, you know what? If you can do that on national TV, then I'm going to do it with my brand, too. So we started creating stories about how putting on a plastic T-shirt will completely change your life. And we did uh, a series of them. And the first one was very unprofessional. The second one got better. This is the third one was... Um, was so popular that they ended up putting it on CETV or Zhongwu Jiao Yukingao on a program called uh, July Juan. Um, so it was aired in front of about 20 million people um, and, it, and it really hit a mark. Is that video ready? Yep. So it tells a story. Um, you can see here. We need some sound. Our dream is to become a world leader. So I thought I'd do something really immature. So what I did was I downloaded the instructions online on how to turn a banknote into a penis. Did you translate that? 
so that you've got the instructions in your bag of how to turn a one RMB note into a cock, all right? And I put an email on the flyer that says, it's, it's the big one at plaster.com. If you can successfully turn that one RMB note into a you know what, email me the picture and you'll win a big prize from Plaster. Also, for each one of you to actually send me an email, I'm going to give money to charity as well. So there's an absolute, you know, whatever you call it, you want to do it, all right? Try and fold that into the, you've got the instructions there. I'm going to give about sort of 50 RMB for every single one that's sent to me to charity, to these children's charities. The biggest, not the biggest one, sorry, the best one uh, will win a signed piece of plastered original artwork. That's all from me, the most immature guy in Beijing. Thank you very much. Woo!